Well, blessed Monday to you as we come to you with your daily encouragement. And we are in Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Life Together, and we have been focusing on prayer. Now we're going to focus on the Table Fellowship and uh, Bonhoeffer's insights on that. He says, We have been following the course of Christian communities' morning worship. God's word, the hymn of the church, the prayer of the fellowship, stand at the threshold of the day. Not until the fellowship has been nourished and strengthened with the bread of eternal life does it come together to receive God's earthly bread for this temporal life. Giving thanks and asking God's blessing, the Christian family receives the daily bread from the hand of the Lord. Ever since Jesus Christ sat at the table with his disciples, the table fellowship of his community has been blessed by his presence. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were open, and they knew him. Luke 24 30 through 31. Of course, that last passage was from the visitors who had visited Jesus on their way to Emmaus and then were amazed to see the replication of Holy Communion as the way we meet with the Lord as much as we meet together. Now, we could get into some interesting discussions about how often we are to have communion. I think that there is some great logic and precedence of having weekly communion. I have not been at a church that has done that, but um, I've tried to plant the seeds every so often of the possibility of doing that. I don't want it to be something that rises and falls on my leadership. I think it has to be a groundwork re leadership, and that's why I've always tried to be very careful on pressing it, because I've seen some congregations that do it, and then immediately after the pastor leaves, then they stop doing weekly communion and things of that nature. And so there is always a tension about how much you press as a leader of a congregation. But one of the things that is important about the table fellowship we share is that it goes back to the earliest of passed on, quote unquote, liturgies of the church. Now, we talked last week about um, formal and informal prayer, and sometimes we can be too formal. But one ritual, besides probably even baptism, is Holy Communion that we know from the very beginning of a Christian fellowship was done and are probably some of the oldest words that have been passed on. In fact, it was the theologian uh, Grundvig who was famous among qu or the quote-unquote happy Danes who had said it's the words of the Apostles' Creed and specifically the words of institution that are the earliest words of Scripture, even before the Bible was created. These words sustained people, and I think he's right on that. It was an oral fellowship. Not everyone who came to church knew how to read. In fact, we didn't even have a New Testament until we get much, much later. I mean, books were being formed during that time, and they did have the basis of worship with readings from the Old Testament in which they found pointers to Jesus Christ. But it was the table fellowship of bread and wine that brought and brings people together today. Now we have all these interesting rules about that table fellowship. Some of us have an open table, at least that's what we practice in our form of Lutheranism. I must say that many of the other denominations within Lutheranism have more of a close or closed type of idea of communion with a certain understanding that needs to be instilled before we break bread together. Now, I'm not saying that well, us with open communion authorize breaking bread with everybody. We don't want to have fake reconciliation with people. And that's even if we have some views that are not confessed in common yet. I do believe that it is Jesus in, with, and under the bread and wine that brings us together. And so it is important for us to be open to that. That God is not just um, authorizing common meals, God is making us common together. And part of that is in our hearts and minds, because even if you have the right confession or belong to the same denomination, guess what enters into it? 
And I kid you not, it doesn't matter whether you're all of the same church and confession, sin will be the divider between you. And that's why Paul is so in enforcement of when he says, you know, if you know of a sin that is dividing you from someone else, reconcile yourself to that person before you go up to the altar. And I would say, not necessarily that it has to be before, but I would say soon afterwards, because the presence of Jesus, the presence in, with, and under a bread and wine can be the thing that can um, remind us that we are not in right relationship with everyone around this table, within this fellowship, within this time together. And we need to be about reconciliation. Because that's what Jesus was about, even as he gave himself up. And even as he is in with and under a bread that is whole and that is now being split apart in order to feed us, we have to remember that the thing that brings that loaf together, the thing that brings us together, the thing that brings the broken body together is our reconciliation to God and to one another. So it is the earliest of the liturgies of the church, and it is the most important. And everything up to this point, whether it be the hymns, the prayers, the confessions, and all the things that we've been talking about, it is to share in table fellowship with one another. Because that's how Christians celebrated their reconciliation. They would sit down at the table of those who were clean or unclean, in fact, that was what shocked Peter so much in Acts 10. It was all of a sudden all the things that had separated and made him distinctive now were becoming commonplace on the table of Cornelius, the Greek uh, officer who later became a Christian. And it is important for us that this open fellowship is one that Jesus directs. Jesus is our host, even though it comes from a pastor or my hands and I always say that even with the baptismal water, that's why I always like to use the pass, passive voice, which is in our, our green hymnal. So-and-so is baptized, not necessarily by my hands, but by the hands of the Holy Spirit. In fact, one of the more interesting passages of baptism is Jesus' baptism by John, and specifically in Luke's Gospel, because in Luke's Gospel, it almost seems that John has disappeared into the brightness of the Spirit of God, and Jesus is truly baptized by the Holy Spirit. And it is the same, I feel, whenever I do Holy Communion. I, I can be honest and say it, I don't always feel spiritual all the time, but I know that what is being done is spiritual. It is bringing people together. And it is my faithfulness in simply saying the words that are more powerful than I. This is my body, this is my blood, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Those words are what bind us together. Those words are what keep us together as believers around the table. God bless you today. We trust that these continue to be words of encouragement. Take care. God bless. We'll see you tomorrow.